Good morning. Join us as we come into worship and to his presence. If you would, stand to your feet and come on in for, to the sanctuary. <laughs> My name is Rich Ginto. I'm the worship pastor here at Light of Christ Church. I'm so glad you guys could come in. Beautiful weather, yes? Glorious out there. God's a good God. If you would, I'll give you an opportunity just to turn around to a few of your neighbors and welcome them today this morning.
heads, you can be seated if just for a moment. Welcome. Welcome to Light of Christ. My name, well, we've got lots of enthusiasm around the greeting time today. I'm feeling it. All right. Welcome to Light of Christ. I'm Marianne Romanat, and I'm the lead pastor here. It's so good to have you with us. And if you'll take a moment to pull out your bulletin and tear off the right portion. Um, this is a connection card, and it is an opportunity for you to share with us. And if you're a first or second time guest, we ask that you fill it out completely and let us know about yourself so that we can know that you were here and a little bit about you. And then on the reverse side, there's a place for all of us to share prayer requests. Um, if, you're, if you've been here more than two times, then just share that your, na your names of who's here um, to worship today. That way we know that you've been with us and we can um, contact those who've not been with us in a while to make sure that everything's okay with them. But we regularly pray that God would send the people he has in mind for Light of Christ. And so we're glad that you're here and we know that that's an answer to our prayer. And uh, we're here to seek God and hear from him today. So I pray you'll leave encouraged um, knowing that you've been with him. Now let's stand and continue to sing.
we just come before you in this time of worship, submitting our hearts, submitting our minds to commune with your spirit. Because God, we need you. We need you every hour.
Well, these last few Sundays, as I've been preparing sermons for this sermon series about the church, uh, the body beautiful, it's been interesting to, at the same time, teach the Discover Light of Christ class. And we've had uh, quite a diverse group of folks, and many of them are going to join the church today at the end of our service, and some of them will be joining later on. And um, they have really fleshed out for me, literally, the meaning of this sermon series. As I've been preaching about the church and how much God loves the church and how beautiful the church is, I've seen it in them, and I've seen the church uh, assemble itself uh, through those God is sending to be part of our church. So uh, that's been an exciting way to, to look at this sermon series. And so the call of this series is to, for us to love the church as God does. And sometimes we struggle with the church, and that's difficult to do. Uh, the church is not perfect. And as I said before, as soon as you say that you're representing God uh, in Jesus Christ, then you're in big trouble because we've got faults and ways that we do that imperfectly every day. But still, God loves the church and sees the church as literally the hope of the world and his plan. And so we're called to love her as well. Uh, Chris Yurton is coming this morning to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in this passage, uh, Paul describes the unity in diversity that the church is called to express. Good morning. Uh, verse 12 through 18. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we are all given this one spirit to drink. Even so, but, so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now at the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of heart of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. In verse 26 through 27. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Amen. So here, early church leader Paul compares the church to his most common image for it, which is the body this human body that we have all been given to take care of. And what an amazing gift we have. Um, I, was, I did some study this week about the human body. And of course, you know how remarkable the body is. Um, there's all these different complex systems working together to take care of our health. And then we have, you know, we have systems that are um, bringing, you know, digesting food, and we have other systems that are delivering that uh, to every part of the body. And then we have a system that takes out toxins, um, even our own defense system built in to fight off anything that would attack us, uh, our health. And so it's just an amazing body that we have. And Paul, I think, is recognizing the complexity of the body, uh, although maybe not all the science was known then that is known today, he knew enough to know that it's remarkable what our bodies can do. And so he said the church is like that, complex and beautiful and amazing in what it can accomplish when working together in the right way. And so he talks about that, and one of the things I learned this week that I've found to be amazing, I actually learned this from a, a fact book that my little boy is reading, did you know that there are 60,000 miles of blood vessels in one human body? If you lay blood vessels end to end, 60,000 miles, to put that into context, the circumference of the globe is 25,000 miles. So within your body, the blood vessels laid end to end could encircle the earth twice and still have 10,000 miles of blood vessels to go. How is that possible? I've been thinking about that. I'm having dreams about blood vessels now. <laughs> That's just one system in our body, the circulatory system. So how amazing the gift that God has given and how impossible that it's randomly made, just so intelligently designed. And so 
the, Paul says the church is like a human body. Many different members with many different functions. And the parts are all so different, but yet all part of one. And when one part suffers, every part suffers. I always like to say, if you've ever had a sore big toe, you know that that's true. It makes your whole body hurt when one part of your body hurts. So we're all connected. When one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. And then if we are working together well and not fighting against each other, then we can do amazing things together. So the, the essential nature of every member of the body and the ministry of, of all Christians in the body of Christ, all of this can be seen in the, the human body. In this passage that Chris read, Paul emphasizes not comparing ourselves with one another. The foot not saying, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong. Or the ear not saying, you know, because I'm not an eye, I'm, I'm just not good enough. I mean, some of us feel like that. Maybe we don't have anything to contribute to the church. Like I, I like to say, some of us think that we're the appendix of this body of Christ. You know, they're just not, not offering too much. But did you know that it's recently been discovered that the appendix actually does have an important function in the body? Did you know that? Just recently they discovered this. And that is that the, the positive bacteria that your digestive system needs finds a, find a respite in the appendix and can multiply and grow and thrive so that your whole digestive system runs well. So that's just recently been discovered. So every part of the church, every member of the church has an important role, an important function. It may not be the same as mine and may not be the same as the person beside you, but you have a unique role and a unique gifting from God, spiritual gifts that you've been given to build up the body of Christ. So here's the challenge to celebrate the differences. I don't know about you, but I get annoyed with people who are different from me. <laughs> and I want to say, why can't you be more like me? Why can't you think like I do? Why can't you do the same things I'm good at, right? And sometimes we, we start that, that negativity around the edges, criticizing one another because of different styles, different personalities, different gifts. And brothers and sisters, that's not God's will because the diversity is quite beautiful when it's all employed for the goodness of God. And so we have to forgive each other a little bit for being different. And we have to recognize that as a strength for the whole body of Christ. Thank goodness we're not all the same. If we were all good at the same things, look, think of all the things that wouldn't take place through the ministry of the body of Christ. And so rather than beating up one another for being different from each other, instead we can see that as God's design, as varying gifts placed intentionally within the body of Christ. Paul talks about that in this passage. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So could it be that God has placed you in this body of Christ, this local church, for a reason? Could it be that that was an intentional decision and you're stuck with us for a reason, right? I see it all the time. I look around and I'm amazed by the varying gifts and how God uses each person in a different way to function. And so we, we view that as part of God's plan for us. And we, we feel that we are so different, but the reality is with all the differences that we have, we really have more in common. We're more alike than we are different. And that's because the most important thing about us, that our lives are all about this God who has invaded our world and our lives, our lives are about that God and so, on the inside, we're really all the same. In Johnny's class one day, the teacher asked, what color is an apple? All the hands shot up. And all the kids started to say, red. Apples are red. 
And the teacher said, yes, apples are red. That's right. Then another little boy raised his hand. He said, well, I know something about apples, and I know that apples aren't just red. Some apples are green. And the teacher said, yeah, you're right. Some apples are green. Johnny raised his hand, and the teacher called on Johnny. And Johnny said, no, that's not right. Apples aren't red, and they aren't green. Apples are white. And the teacher said, Johnny, no, apples are not white. Apples are sometimes red, and they're sometimes green. And some apples are even yellow, but Johnny, apples are not white. And he said, no, teacher, I know something about apples, and I know that if you cut into an apple, it's always white. And so Johnny was right. Apples are white. On the inside, we're all the same. We may look different. We may have different preferences, likes and dislikes. We may have different styles, ways of relating to people or ways of talking or ways of doing tasks. But on the inside, we're all the same. We have the love of God within us because the Holy Spirit has been given to us, poured out on us. We have the same feelings. We have many of the same experiences in life. On the inside, we're all the same. And the main reason we have this unity is because of what Jesus has done. He's broken down every barrier that would keep us apart. Paul talked about that radical unity in Galatians 3, 27 and 28, when he wrote, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying that the labels don't matter. The labels that we put on people to try to define them They're just side issues, these labels of of race, these labels of status, gender, background, political opinions, what kind of fan of what team you are. These are all just side issues. And Paul says they're meaningless, really, because you have clothed yourselves with Christ. He says, now that's what you're about. You've identified yourself with Jesus You know God in a personal way, and now nothing else matters because of how precious that relationship with Christ is. If you've identified yourself with Jesus, nothing else comes close to defining you. Your identity is in him. You have no need to be called anything else but a Christ follower. So someone may try to label me or you as white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Male, female, single, married, Democrat, Republican, independent, conservative, liberal, rich, poor, successful in career, unemployed. And when those labels come on us, as Christians, we should resist that and resist it on the behalf of others as well. Because we are not those things. We belong to Christ. My identity is in Christ because I've been baptized and set apart for the gospel. And that's what my life is all about, Paul is saying. And Paul says it not only changes everything for each of us as individuals, but also changes the way we relate to each other. That, it, that the cross is not just about the vertical relationship, although, that, of course, that's so important to be reconciled to God, but also the cross is about horizontal relationships between us. And so not only are we reconciled with God, but we're reconciled with all other people whom Christ died for. So every wall is broken down. Jesus' blood has brought that, that forgiveness and that reconciliation. Those artificial roadblocks that people put between themselves have been torn down by love. And instead, there's a bridge that has been built in Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus did all the time. If you read about his life, you see him constantly breaking down the barriers. 
speaking in public with women, touching those who were considered unclean, eating with sinners. He found ways to break down everything that kept people from just being God's kids, just being one, recognizing that we're all the same, even if we look different. We really are just God's kids. Chuck Swindoll once said that if the church were truly living out the unity and diversity that Paul describes, that the world would wonder, how in the world is there such a spirit of harmony and joy among that many people, the church, with such diverse opinions? And then Swindoll went on to say, what they don't realize is our opinions don't matter. What matters is God's opinion. And so it doesn't matter if you and I disagree on side issues, right? If we went around the room and talked about some controversial subjects, I guarantee you there'd be a lot of opinions in this room. But we're family because Jesus made us so. So those things don't matter because we belong to Christ. We've clothed ourselves with him, with his righteousness and with his love. And so we can agree to disagree. Did you know that's a Methodist phrase? John Wesley coined that phrase, agree to disagree. Hallelujah. Glad to be a Methodist, right? <laughs> hey, another good reason to be Methodist. But, but we, can, we can be family anyway. I mean, I've had people say some pretty, pretty awful things to me because I'm a woman in the ministry. And if they are in Christ, if they're a Christian, I say, hey, I agree to disagree, and you're still my brother or sister. Act to God be the glory because we can live together and not have to agree on every single detail. We just agree on Christ. So if Jesus was known for breaking down those walls, and if he regularly hung out with those who were considered irreligious sinners, and if he was criticized for that, then how is it that Christians have gotten such a bad reputation that is contrary to Jesus' reputation, in that his followers have the reputation, at least out there in the secular world, of setting up barricades to keep people out? of the church. Now, whether or not that stereotype is true, my friends, it is out there, okay? So how did we get that reputation? That we're so judgmental and so critical and we don't want anybody coming in from the outside. Lord, forgive us for that reputation. Help us, God, to get a new reputation. Because when a newcomer comes in who's never been part of a church before, the reaction they should have is, I cannot believe how welcome I feel. These people treat me like family. And that is powerful. To have that kind of reaction from those who have been outsiders who now have been brought near. That is the reaction that Jesus gave to people when he met them. So what if the church were known for opening doors rather than barring them shut in fear? What if Christians were known for breaking down walls more than erecting barriers to keep people out? What if the mandate of love caused us to be unafraid and truly open to people because we are really just the same? I'll never forget the Sunday years ago. I had a Sunday off and I decided to go to a church in my community that I'd never been to before. I didn't know the pastor and just decided to go and worship. And so I was sitting there and listened to the sermon, and it was about a 15-minute sermon. It was pretty brief. And then I realized why we were having communion that day. And he came down to the communion table and started to, um, I thought, give an invitation to communion, but it actually ended up that it was quite the opposite. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that all the reasons he gave why you should not come to the table was longer than the sermon. I was shocked by it. He went on and on about all the reasons why you shouldn't come. It was so odd. He said things like, if you have any unconfessed sin in your life, don't come. If you're not a Bible-believing Christian, don't come. If you have anything against a brother or a sister and you need to take care of that, don't come. On and on for 15 minutes. Now, he meant well. I knew where he was coming from. There's some biblical support for the things he was saying. And we do want to confess our sins before God and be reconciled to one another before we come to the table. There's no doubt. But the way he said it 
made me feel about two centimeters high. And I thought, sat there and thought to myself, Lord, have mercy, who in this congregation can come and receive communion today? I mean, honestly. And I was like, I'm going in boldness in Jesus' name. I said, I'm coming, Lord. <laughs> he said I was going to eat and drink judgment on my head. Now, once again, that, it's biblical what he's saying. I got what he was saying. I understood where he was coming from. He's still my brother in Christ, right? But holy moly, if you had been new to the church that day, you'd run as fast as you could in the other direction because you'd think, I'm not in that club. And so God help us to open closed doors. This is not the way the church should represent the Jesus who welcomed the sinner, who said that he came not to save the righteous, but sinners. Jesus made it clear what it's all about. He said in John 13, 35, By this they will know you're my disciples, if you love one another. Not if you have lots of Bible studies, or if you make lots of converts, or if you go out and serve in the community, or if you have a vital enough prayer ministry. Now, these are all good things, and we want these things in the church. But Jesus said, when you boil it right down, the way they're going to know you're with me is love. Otherwise, it's a clanging symbol. It doesn't mean a whole lot. I believe, brothers and sisters, how we treat each other is more important than what we decide to do together in ministry. It means a lot more to God. My friends, let us love one another and appreciate the differences. Be enriched by them. Learn from one another. There are a lot of cheesy church signs out there. I'm not a big fan of church signs. But I do like this one. What's missing in CHCH? You are. I like that one. Imagine the fullness of the body of Christ, my friends, if everyone were part. If every part of the body were assembled in the body of Christ, how powerful that would be. And there's some gaps in the body. And we know that they're there. And it's not only a weakness for us as the church, but also a weakness for the world that God loves. Because imagine the power of a complete body of Christ loving and serving God and serving neighbor and loving neighbor. Wow. What a powerful force for God's purposes. And so if you have a lot of excuses for not being part of the church because she's imperfect or full of hypocrites or because the church asks too much of you, then what's missing? You are. You are truly missed. And God's unique calling for you is not being fulfilled. Come and be part of the body. When you came into worship, you should have received a puzzle piece. Pull it out. If you didn't get one, raise your hand because we have extras. Yeah, raise your hand. Everybody needs a puzzle piece. It's very important. Okay. So just pull out the puzzle piece, and here, here they come to give you extras. And uh, just keep your hands up, and they're coming. And just look at your piece. Um, take a look at what is unique about your piece. Compare it to the people beside you and kind of see how is that different. Maybe the colors are different. The shapes are different. You see the differences. Okay. Now imagine if we were to put this puzzle together. Somebody asked me, are we putting the puzzle together after church? <laughs> I said, we'd be here a while because I actually tried to put this puzzle together and it was really hard. Um, but imagine if we were to put the puzzle together after church and imagine if one of you didn't stay. Then there would be one piece. Have you ever put together a puzzle and there's one piece missing? And you just like crawl all around the room and you're looking under the couches and the tables and it drives you crazy because that one piece is missing. I think that's how God feels about his children who are missing from the body because God knows how much more beautiful and complete the picture could be if each part were, were part. So think about what is it about you that is unique that God has made you special. Maybe it's a, a way of doing things. Maybe it's your personality. Uh, maybe it's spiritual gifts that you know you have. Some of you are aware of what your spiritual gifts are. 
Okay, some of you are not, and maybe you want to find that out, and, you, and I can help you with that, by the way. Um, maybe it's a ministry that you love and you give your heart and soul to. Um, what is it? Turn to the person beside you, and if you don't know, you can say, I don't know. But turn to the person beside you and just one person, tell them, what, is, what does your piece represent? What is your part in the body of Christ? Just for a minute. Okay, and switch if you haven't already. All right. So what I want you to do today is I want you to take this with you. And I want you to just find a little place for this. Maybe you put it in your change purse or tuck it in your wallet. Um, maybe put it up on your mirror in the bathroom or put it on your dashboard in your car, somewhere where every once in a while you're going to run across it. And let it be a reminder that you are a special part of the body of Christ, and without you, she is not complete. And that you are blessed by God to be uniquely shaped for ministry. That he gave you the, the shape that you are uh, in terms of your gifting and your personality for a reason. And that this can be a reminder for you to be using that, to be part of the church and what God is doing through his church. And just to remember that no one else can contribute what you can. Let it be a reminder to you to love the church because God does. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we offer to you our piece of the puzzle. And thank you, God, that we are interlocking with those around us. You've woven us together by your grace. Help us, God, to be the kind of community you envision, a community of love, a community that welcomes the stranger, and that celebrates the differences, that allows for the unity and diversity. We pray that you'd be glorified, God, by the ways that we are the same and the ways that we are different. Send us, Lord, to be your servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We want to invite you in this time as we do this next song to feel free to pray, to seek God's face, to reflect on the message. Feel free to pray in your seat or even down here at the front in the altar area.
Good morning. My name is Abby Thomas, and I'm the youth pastor here. And I would just like to share with you some things that are coming up in our church. And the first thing is this week on Wednesday, we are meeting at um, Stonecrest Regal Cinemas to watch the Son of God movie premiere. It's actually, we're getting to watch it before it actually comes out. And we still have tickets for that. We've sold 90 tickets, but we have up to 165. And we have people who are more than willing to pay for tickets if cost is an issue. Um, and any youth who are inviting friends to this event, no matter how many friends you invite, their tickets are covered. Um, so invite your friends, uh, sign up. We can still sell tickets in the lobby today. It's just going to be a wonderful event. So we invite you to that. We also next week start after church a top 10 events of the Bible study with Pastor Marianne. And that will be happening every Sunday in March. And we invite you to be a part of this grow group. And coming up, we have a women's retreat. And today is actually the deadline for that retreat. So that's March 21st and 22nd. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. So if you haven't signed up yet, today is the deadline. And that sign up is in the lobby. We also are preparing for a trip to Bainis, Haiti, and that mission trip will take place in November, and if you have any interest in that, please contact Tom Harmon, and we're just looking ahead, preparing for that trip, because it takes a lot of time to prepare, and so just pray about whether God's calling you to be a part of that in November. And we've got our Ash Wednesday service, which is a special service on March 5th two Wednesdays from now at 6.30 p.m., and this will begin the Lytton season, and we would love for you to join us and to mark that on your calendars to have that special service here with us on Wednesday, March 5th. And now let's prepare for our time of prayer. I just want to share a few prayer requests this morning um, that need folks who really need our prayers in our church family. Uh, one is that Merle Bowen's uh, son, Alan, passed away this week, and he was living in South Africa. Uh, Merle's here this morning, and we love you, Merle, and we're praying for you and your whole family. Um, also, Estelle Brindle, her sister, Betty, passed away um, on Friday morning, and I know that uh, she is one of those women who's been prayed through many times uh, with lots of miracles, and now she's received the ultimate miracle. Um, so let's be lifting up Estelle and her family. Uh, Gary Nordling had a surgery this week, and we're praying for his recovery. Um, he had a, a tendon repaired in his arm. Um, Leslie Gento and Jan, um, gosh, I can't think of your last name, Pew, <laughs> goodness, um, fell, it fell in the lovely ice and have injured themselves, and so they're having MRIs and such, and so just be lifting them up uh, for, in prayer. And then uh, finally, Denise Hembry has the flu, and that's why she's not here this morning. So let's pray for her also. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God, for hearing our prayers for those members of our body um, who need you and who need your special touch of grace and healing. And we lift up Merle and her family, Estelle and her family. We also lift up Gary and Leslie and Jan for your healing touch and Denise we pray for this Son of God movie event this Wednesday, that it would be truly impactful for those who need to be drawn closer to you, including ourselves, God. But we pray that we could reach out and include those who are now sitting outside um, of your family. We pray that we could draw them in through this event and that you would draw them to yourself and to faith in Christ. So use it to your glory, we pray. We thank you for uh, those who are joining our church today, and we pray you would prosper their faith, grow them as disciples of Christ because of this season here with us, and we pray that they would be blessed to be a blessing. We thank you for this worship service and all the ways that you have spoken to us and that you'll continue to walk with us um, later as we leave today. Now we offer to you our gifts so that ministry can take place and thrive and be abundant. So now we give our offerings to you, God. May you multiply them and use them for your kingdom purposes. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and give our offerings. No. Oh. 
for just one more minute, and I want to invite uh, forward those from the recent Discover Light of Christ class who were coming to make a commitment to God and to this local church. You guys can just gather up here at the front. These are some wonderful people. I want to introduce them to you, and I'm going to put their pictures up on the screen uh, with their names so you know who they are. First of all, the Gross family, uh, Hal, Sherry, Zach, and Aaron, and then Shardella Hilly. Um, then the Lober family, Justin, Denise, and their son, Charlie, Emily Parrott. Um, this was the first class where we had some youth take, our, take this class, and I was thrilled to see that. Um, so the Emily, and then Christine Tidwell, Rachel Velasquez, and her two daughters, Rebecca and Frances, and Abigail Vincent. So if you're happy to see them coming forward to make this commitment, let's hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. It's, it's a way to grow in Christ. It's not a way to be an insider. You understand the difference? It's a way to commit to God and to grow in our faith. And that's why you guys are here, and I'm thankful for that. So those of you who are making membership commitments, I want to ask you these questions. Do you repent of your sins and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. And do you believe the Christian faith as found in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, Testaments? If so, say, I do. I do. And do you promise, according to God's grace, to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and to remain a faithful member of Christ's church? If so, say, I do. I do. And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? If so, say, I will. I will. And we're so thankful. And members of the family of God, I commend these people to your care, that you would help them to come, grow, and go as, as you do the same. And if you will gladly receive them and take that commitment seriously, say, we will. We will. All right, amen. Um, these folks are going to come and stand with me, and we're going to um, be out in the lobby, and we'd love for you to give them a, a warm handshake or a hug. And Rick Dewar has the final word this morning. So you guys come with me. Good morning. My name is Rick Dewar, and I'm on the Staff Parish Relations Committee. And um, we have a big day coming up this week. Watch this video.
Happy birthday, Rich. We love you and appreciate all you do. Have a great week. Go in peace.